It's a great pleasure to have here uh, Matthew Collis. Um, you've seen a lot of the work that uh, he's done already earlier in the course because he was the leader of the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey, and we've seen that rotating red diagram showing the distribution of galaxies and the motions of these things many times. He's also our director here at the moment. So, Matthew, Hi, welcome. Yeah. Good to be here. Now, the standard question we're asking is, what's the, been the biggest breakthrough in astronomy since you've been a professional astronomer? Well, it's not so much a, a single breakthrough as a continuous stream of breakthroughs. I, I work in observational cosmology, like Brian, and for us, the field has changed out of recognition over the 30 years that I've been in the business. When I started out, we knew nothing about dark energy, we knew nothing about dark matter, we had very little idea of what any of the fundamental cosmological parameters actually were, and all of those things have been changed out of sight over those 30 years. It's just been an incredible ride for those of us involved in this particular profession. Can you identify any reason why there was this revolution? I mean, did you think you got your PhD in 1987? So in 1987, it was a pretty murky picture. We didn't know what was going on. Did you think it was all going to be this crystal clear by 2014? No, I, I, it wasn't clear to me that it was going to be so clear, but the signs were there. And I mean, one of the things that struck me immediately when I started doing my PhD at Cambridge was the whole CCD revolution, which was just really beginning to pick up at that point. In the early to mid 80s, we suddenly went from photographic plates to CCD detectors, and it was clear that technology was driving observational cosmology very rapidly indeed. At that point, it was taking it far faster than theory could keep up. And so there's been this ongoing arms race between observation and theory with one leapfrogging the other over time. And during that period, it's always been the technology that's taken it over, the satellite technology that's enabled us to go from the ground-based measurements of the microwave background to the exquisite measurements we now have with WMAP and Planck and so on. And on the ground, of course, the increase in telescope aperture as well. We started out four meter telescopes were the rule using photographic plates. We now have eight and 10 meter telescopes with powerful CCD detectors. And we're about to go to the 25 and 30 meter telescopes, which will be yet more powerful still. And so throughout, Technology has been the driving force, and that's allowed the observational cosmologists to race out in front, make new discoveries, and drag theory along after them. So let's go through and think a little bit about the future. So we're asking you to think about, let's say over the next 10 years, you've mm. highlighted there's some new technology. What's it going to give us, do you think? You're, let's, I want you to forecast. Now, we know this is hard to do in practice, but give us your best guess 10 years from now what you think you're going to say was the most exciting thing over the last 10 years. So what I hope I'm going to be able to say over the last 10 years has been the most exciting thing 10 years from now is that we'll have actually identified the dark matter particle. We will actually know what it is. In fact, we may even discover that it's more than one thing. It's only Occam's razor to lead you to believe that it's exactly one species of particle. But I hope that from laboratory experiments, we will actually know what these things really are. And that will clean out at least one area and give us a big clue as to things beyond the standard model of fundamental physics right now. I also hope that we'll have nailed down exactly what the nature of dark energy is in the astrophysical cosmological context. In other words, we will know what the impact of dark energy is on the evolution of the universe. Now, we may not understand the physical origin precisely, but we should at least know that it behaves, let us say, exactly as one would predict for a cosmological constant. And so there'll no longer be much room for argument about that. Whether or not that will lead to a real theoretical understanding is not so clear to me. And of course, 10 years from now, I'm hoping that the big new telescopes like the Giant Magellan Telescope that we're involved in here at ANU will be up and running. And I'm hoping that those will lead to big new breakthroughs as well. One of the things I'm hoping for there, actually, is not so much in my field of observational cosmology, but in understanding planets around other stars. One of the things I'm really looking forward to is using those telescopes to probe the atmospheres of other planets. Actually knowing what's in the atmosphere of planets around other stars is going to be pretty fantastic and really going to change the way people in general think about our universe. Now, over the next 10 years, we have a fairly good idea of what telescopes are going to be there because they're all currently being designed and under construction. But let's look a bit further forward, so maybe 50 or 100 years. 
you've said that since about the 1970s when the first CCDs started coming along, we've had this exponential increase in our observing. Can that continue? I mean, the CCDs are already over 90% efficient at many wavelengths. Uh, are we going to hit some limit? Are things going to slow down and maybe some other things going to drive it? Or do you think we can keep on with this exponential increase in performance beyond the next 10 years? I think we're fairly safe in the next 10 years, but when it goes 20, 30, 40 years, is things going to slow down? No, I, I really don't think so. Unless the human race manages to make our planet less habitable or at least less economically viable than it currently is, I don't think technology is about to hit the real fundamental physical limits that exist. There are some, and you've pointed out one of them already, but there are so many other areas where we're nowhere near them. We're just beginning, for example, to make the most of neutrino astronomy and gravitational wave astronomy. Those things are in their complete infancy right now. And 100 years from now, I'm hoping those will be tools that are as familiar and as common to astronomers of that time as electromagnetic radiation is today. I also hope that we'll be doing much more from space and that we'll be able to get the human race up and out into space so that we can do wonderful things like put a giant radio telescope on the far side of the moon where free from radio frequency interference and able to do astonishing things because of the sensitivity that it will be able to achieve. I also hope that we'll have know enough about planets around other stars that we'll be beginning to consider 100 years from now actually going to visit some of those stars. Now that's a, a thousand year project perhaps, but I hope that in 100 years from now, we'll actually have been able to say, yes, there are targets worth visiting where we can go and learn about other habitable worlds, maybe even worlds that might contain life. And although I doubt it will be me that will be taking those journeys, I certainly hope that it will be my children or my grandchildren or even the artificially intelligent grandchildren of the human race who take that journey and go out and visit the stars. Okay, well, thank you very much. My pleasure.